Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I'm Louise Jennings. I'm a professor in the School of Education and um, co-coordinator of the Education Equity Transformation, or EET, doctoral program. And um, I am grateful to be joined today by five doctoral students from that program, Lauren Valine, Corinne Singleton, Alejandra Pinder, Nicole Lamb, and Ross Atkinson. So we are here uh, to talk about our presentation titled Refusing to Return to Normal, Lessons from the COVID, Racism, Environmental and Disinformation Pandemics. We see these as intersecting pandemics. Um, and in the EET program in, uh, in October 2020, we had an opportunity to participate in a webinar put on by the National Academy of Education. Um, that they uh, opened a virtual forum called COVID-19 and Educational Inequities, where they said that the pandemic has exposed deep systemic problems in the content, structure, financing, and governance of schools. Although known to education and other social science researchers for decades, the scourge of inequality has now become apparent to a wider public. Indeed, the coronavirus crisis coincides with what many describe as three additional pandemics, America's reawakening to realities of racial injustice and violent extremism, an economic recession that shows no signs of significant recovery in the near term, and a climate crisis. And building from that virtual forum, um, we in the Education Equity and Transformation Program created a special topic seminar using this as a springboard. Um, we created a course I called Pandemic Pedagogies that set about to critically examine how these intersecting pandemics of COVID, racism, we added disinformation to political violence and environmental crisis shine a spotlight on foundational issues and equities, inequities in our broad broader educational system. So not just the PK-12 system, but also looking at early childhood, post-secondary, adult education, and community education contexts. And then to reimagine education to pro propose new ways forward through systemic and structural transformation. So that was our work. Um, and uh, five of the students are here today and are gonna be sharing with you from the work that we did during that spring 2021 um, course. Um, what our kind of overriding mantra was that we don't want to return to normal. We kept hearing from people, from friends, family, from the media, you know, when are we going to get back to normal? And we said, you know, the whole point of our program in EET is not to return to normal, but to restructure and not to return to a status quo. Um, we were inspired by Sonia Renee Taylor, who said, we will not go back to normal. Normal never was. Our pre-corona existence was not normal, other than we normalized greed, inequity, exhaustion, depletion, extraction, disconnection, confusion, rage, hoarding, hate, and lack. We should not long to return, my friends. We are being given the opportunity to stitch a new garment one that fits all of humanity and nature. And so we set about in that course to stitch a new garment, thinking what can we do to um, examine and understand these inequities that have been always there, but made more visible and more likely exacerbated through these intersecting pandemics. We asked, what can we do about it? So we did a number of things in the course, and then eventually students worked in teams to take up particular issues in educational contexts and ask, what is this issue? How have inequities deepened during the intersecting pandemics and why? And then what bold steps for systemic transformative action do we propose? So today we're gonna to be sharing from five of those um, team projects to really look at cases that address, again, when we're looking at transformation, we're looking at systemic change, um, changes that are not just one-off, but sustainable changes to systems, to structures, to policies and practice. So looking at systemic practice, Ross and Corinne will be sharing with us from their projects. 
we'll then have a Jamboard reflection to engage all of you, because we do want to engage all of you as much as we can in our hour and a half together today. And then Alejandra, Nicole, and Lauren will be examining issues addressing policy. And then we'll hope to have, uh, we've planned to have time for small group discussions and breakout rooms, and then a whole group discussion, thinking about how can we apply these lessons to create transformation within your own spheres of influence. So we ask that you think about your own professional context and how the intersecting pandemics have spotlighted and exacerbated existing inequities. And as we walk through our examples, we ask that you consider what insights, lessons, and actions that we share might apply to your own context. So with that, I'm going to, we're gonna get started with Ross. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Jennings. My name is Ross Atkinson. I'll kick us off here um, talking about the rise of mis and disinformation and fake news. Um, I wanted to start us off with a quote here at the top. You can read Falsehood Flies and the Truth Comes Limping After It by Jonathan Swift. This was published in 1710. And I don't think um, there's another quote published over 300 years ago that feels uh, as um, pertinent to talk about as this one in the moment. Uh, so the problem that I focused in on is how the spread of mis and disinformation regarding vaccine hesitancy, climate change denial, and racial issues have been exacerbated by the COVID pandemic, and how the consequences uh, of these mis and disinformation campaigns have disproportionately affected marginalized populations. Um, and how this impedes educational equity, uh, excellence and equity. So mis and disinformation have engendered a uh, national distrust in scientific authority and process. We've seen this um, through climate change, uh, denial and COVID uh, and vaccines. Um, in addition to exacerbating already entrenched systems of oppression. Um, so we can think about following COVID, a lot of the racism um, that was exacerbated because of that pandemic. Um, on the right here, I wanted to point out before we jump into this presentation, uh, some definitions here. Um, so we have uh, a few that uh, are listed. I wanted to kind of just differentiate between mis and disinformation. So we can read that misinformation is false information that's disseminated regardless of intent to mislead. So we can see this as possibly um, sharing something on Facebook without really digging into it too much, but not really knowing that you're wrong and stating it. Whereas disinformation is misinformation that's deliberately disseminated to mislead. So this is information that people know is incorrect and choose to disseminate it anyway. Um, we also have fake news. Um, this is false information often of a sens sensational nature that mimics news media content. So we can consider this, uh, maybe if you think about some of the pundits that are on some of the opinion shows that go on that kind of um, parade around as news. Um, I won't name any explicitly, but I'm sure we can think of some. Um, and then we also have the continued influence effect. So these two effects down here are um, just uh, are unique uh, uh, terms you might not have heard before, um, and they will come up a couple of times throughout the presentation. So I wanted to just kind of hit on them. The continued influence effect is the continued reliance on inaccurate information in people's memory and reasoning after credible correction has been presented. So it's the, uh, the effect is that we tend to continue to rely on what we know as opposed to new information. Um, and this illusory truth effect is repeated information is more likely to be judged true than novel or new information because it has become more familiar. Um, so information that's repeated over and over and over again kind of sticks with us. Um, before we jump into everything, I kind of wanted to highlight uh, just some empirical articles um, as, and some stats surrounding the effects of mis and disinformation, how they intersect with um, these other various pandemics that my colleagues will be talking about. Um, one is the climate change pandemic. Um, There's a study published in 2017 that highlighted that ideologically motivated vested interest, interest groups have orchestrated influential disinformation campaigns in which they publicly dispute the scientific consensus on various issues, including human caused climate change. Um, so we can see how misinformation plays or disinformation plays a role in there. And racism uh, pandemic that we'll be talking about as well, uh, Chong et al. in 2021, as well as the FBI hate crime statistics kind of highlight um, uh, that some racial groups have experienced a double pandemic, that of COVID-19 and misinformed racist attacks incorrectly tied to the pandemic. Um, so we can see, for example, in 2020, hate crimes targeting people of Asian descent rose over 70% when compared to the year before, um, as an example of that. 
um, and vaccine hesitancy. Uh, so Lumba et al. in 2021, this was published in Nature just this year, um, read that as of September 2020, fewer people would definitely take a vaccine than is likely required for herd immunity, and that relative to factual information, recent misinformation induced a decline of intent of 6.4 percentage points in the U.S. among those who stated they would definitely accept the vaccine. So we can see how misinformation has definitely affected um, uh, vaccine hesitancy, racism, and climate change. Next slide, please. Um, so personally, why I started looking into the effects of mis and disinformation is I do research into veteran populations. And for a while, everything I saw in the news about veterans had to do with the Capitol insurrection and the number of veterans and active service members who participated in the uh, insurrection on our Capitol. You can see some of the headlines here that are on the slide. Um, despite veterans making up only 7% of the total U.S. population, they make up almost a fifth of all capsule, Capitol insurrectionists being charged currently in the riot. And we can make hypotheses about why this population specifically is overrepresented in the attack on our democracy. But one thing we do know, um, even from their own testimony at the trials concerning the insurrection, is that mis and disinformation played a vital role in getting them there. Um, the question then is how and why does mis and disinformation spread? taking into account all of the various areas we've discussed and how can we fight the spread of misinformation starting and how we educate our citizenry, citizenry and what role do schools play in this process? Next slide, please. So the how and why, um, the effects of the COVID pandemic, um, we can look at uh, social media convergence. So during the pandemic, COVID exacerbated uh, these issues by uh, funneling quarantining people to social media and bias news outlets um, in their search for information about the topic without critically analyzing the sources of information they're reading oftentimes. Um, another thing is repetition and familiarity. So we mentioned that illusory truth effect and continued influence effect um, where uh, novel information is not uh, regarded as, um, as true as information that is repeated over and over and over. Social media supports these kinds of effects because it uh, benefits from feeding related information to people, reinforcing echo chambers. And research shows that repetition makes information more familiar and more information, more familiar information is generally perceived to be more truthful than that novel or new information. Um, also, there's an exacerbated distrust in critical systems and policy. So recently we've seen healthcare and medicine government, science, and scientific research all come under fire um, during the COVID pandemic because of these things, um, which just kind of exacerbates um, the effects of mis- and disinformation, people distrusting authority. So how do we teach, some questions to consider is how do we teach toward critically engaged citizens who espouse a culture of evidence? Um, and how do we teach a trust in scientific authority while also teaching toward citizens critical of the information they intake from those authority figures? Um, and this kind of leads us to, is there a line between distrust of authority and being critical of authority and how can we teach this? Next slide, please. So for the big ideas um, in this class that I came up with, we can scale critical literacy and civic education. Now, we know that critical literacy and civic education exist in schools currently. That's not saying they don't, um, but just kind of scale them up. Um, and maybe have a more core focus on them. One way to do this is to espouse a culture of evidence in schools. Um, this is from a, an article by Stevig in 2020 who states um, that students and citizens in a culture of evidence share a commitment to truth, are open to changing their minds and maintaining a skeptical mindset, and ask for evidence for problematic claims. So the simple act of asking how do we know can become a cultural habit that one attends to uh, in the quality of sources and evidence and argumentation. So kind of embedding that in the culture of your school, maybe in the core components. Um, teach how mis- and disinformation spreads is another big one. Um, so create dialogue around how repetition of information can lead to a belief regardless of any grounding in fact. So that illusory truth effect. Um, talk about the continued influence effect, how we rely on old information more than new information. Another idea is to form interdisciplinary critical, critical literacy classes. So creating interdisciplinary classes working toward the critical evaluation of source material in the real world. Um, so not just Yay. in a uh, science class uh, no. and, and to have teachers across disciplines um, modeling methods of critical analysis. So if you're an English teacher, you might know of the crap test, uh, maybe expand this um, to more than just analyzing the sources they're using in their texts um, and create a classroom environment where everybody can participate. Um, and then finally, providing programs that empower you socially and civically. So we talked a little bit about systems uh, and about if we look at veterans working outside the system uh, as far as the, and all the capital insurrectionists, 
um, trying to create avenues uh, where people can work within systems to affect change. So the idea here is to build school program that provides avenue for youth to critically reflect on and affect change in their communities and the systems they're part of. So it's a power um, thing as well, granting uh, power to people to make change. So model how change happens in a democratic society within existing systems using evidence-based practices across disciplines. An example of this might be having your youth critically reflect uh, on some change they'd wish to see, something like more recycling bins in the school playground or snacks in a vending machine. Um, and then students create a proposal, bring it to a school principal, engage in dialogue with people in positions of power about that issue, and follow through with seeing the cans placed on the playground or the snacks changed. So providing these uh, avenues of power and influence within these systems can help people feel empowered to engage in these systems thoughtfully later in life is the idea. Um, but that uh, is all the time I have. Thanks for listening. We have a little bit more time to reflect on this information here after the next presenter, Corinne, who's going to speak uh, more toward expanding equity in science education. So take us away, Corinne. Great. Thank you so much, Ross, and thank you for giving us all of that great um, information and great ideas and great food for thought around mis and disinformation. Uh, so yeah, as Ross said, I'm going to switch gears a little bit to talk about expanding equity in science education. And here I'm focused mo mostly on K-12 education, although the discussion really applies um, most of it to higher ed as well. And so, of course, as most of you are aware, inequity in education has been a persistent challenge throughout our history. Today, we still see inequities in education across the board in terms of resources, opportunities, and certainly in terms of outcomes as well. Just looking at funding disparities, for example, on average, US school districts spend about $11,000 per pupil each year. But the country's poorest districts receive an average of $1,200 less per pupil than their wealthiest counterparts. And districts with the most students of color receive about $2,000 less, again, per pupil than districts with the fewest students of color. And of course, because students often live in segregated neighborhoods with high poverty, they can, also, they can face a double disparity in that way. We also see disparities in STEM education and outcomes. Um, yep, next one. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this figure shows disparities in science and engineering careers specifically. We can see that white women, black men and women, Latinx men and women are all underrepresented in STEM occupations relative to their representation within the population overall. So what are, we can go on to the next one. So what are some of the factors that contribute to do those disparities? We know that large scale inequities in funding and resources, along with structural and systemic racism, all contribute. And those are all certainly absolutely critical problems to solve. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here, though, to think about science and science instruction in particular. We know that settled ideas about science limit opportunities for marginalized students. And by settled ideas, I mean established and enduring ideas about science that often go unquestioned in our society, but that are oftentimes inadvertently perpetuated in, in education. So science instruction maintains historical assumptions about science as a field, about what science is, who can do science, what it takes to do science well, how scientists think and operate, and so forth. And all of those settled ideas are too narrow to support successful learning opportunities for many students, particularly for students from non-dominant communities. Schooling also legitimizes certain types of knowledge over other types of knowledge. So for example, um, legitimizing academic school-based knowledge over more everyday experiences with science. And science instruction is also often disconnected from students' everyday, everyday lives. And that can be especially true for students from non dominant communities whose lives do not intersect as much with the culture, the formal culture of schooling. Um, so all of these narrowly construed ideas about science uh, ultimately serve to alienate students and create barriers to identity and belonging in science as well. Of course, the COVID pandemic exacerbated these inequities, these educational inequities, as it did um, with so many other inequities that exist in our society. Um, poorly resourced communities, often communities of color, have less access to technology, which of course became absolutely essential for learning as so many schools moved to hybrid and remote modalities. 
And also lower wage workers were more likely to be working in essential areas of the economy. So these essential workers were often unable to work from home, meaning that students had less at home guidance and support for their schooling. And that connects with um, the discussion that my colleague Nicole will share with you later around the childcare crisis in Colorado as well. Um, so going on to the next, yep. So again, along with addressing those large scale systemic inequities, we can also think about how teachers might play a role in supporting equity in science education. And certainly the burden of resolving these challenges does not lie solely with teachers by any means. Um, but thankfully they do have a role to play. And so we know that teachers have an enormous influence in students' lives and experiences. And we actually know quite a lot about justice oriented teaching practices that teachers can use to further equity specifically in science. For example, we know that it's helpful for teachers to adopt asset based perspectives. So rather than focusing on knowledge gaps that need to be fixed or need to be filled, teachers can recognize the strengths that students and families and communities have, including students funds of knowledge and communities cultural wealth and build on those strengths in the science classroom. So taking an asset based approach to science education communicates to students that they do have experience with and knowledge about scientific phenomena in the world. And also importantly that those experiences and that knowledge and those ways of knowing are all valid and relevant to their school based science learning also. Related educators can encourage students to bring their everyday ways of knowing about science to bear in their formal scientific endeavors. This practice is relevant in, in many ways, but one example is when it comes to language, both for native English speakers and for emergent bilinguals. So teachers can encourage students to use the full, their full linguistic repertoire to communicate their scientific thinking and knowledge, rather than requiring precise um, vocabulary in order for students to be able to participate or to be um, considered valued, to be valued rather for their contributions. Teachers can also, teachers and students can also create hybrid spaces or third spaces. So these are spaces by which I really just mean classrooms or any other places where learning is taking place. Um, but the important point is that they integrate home, family, community um, ways of knowing, funds of knowledge, and academic content knowledge. Uh, and they, these spaces help learners to bridge the gap between everyday ways of knowing and disciplinary ways of knowing. Alongside building content expertise, we also have an obligation to build students' identities as scientists and to build their sense of belonging in the field of science. To do this, we need to expand normative ideas about what it means to be good at science. So for example, beyond just focusing on having the right answer or having the answer and making sure that it's accurate, um, teachers can also emphasize the value of other more authentic, really, scientific skills. Things like making good observations, facilitated collaborative problem solving, other things that scientists do in their work in the real world, and that can be valued in science instruction as well to expand the ideas about what it means to be good at science. Um, and finally, we know that science is a social and cultural endeavor, one that has been shaped by centuries uh, of norms. And um, so by really explicitly addressing that history, students and teachers can begin to change those norms and expand boundaries. Um, so we know that some teachers are already using these practices. That's certainly true. And for that matter, some schools and districts and institutes of higher education are also thinking systematically about equity focused instruction. Uh, in other places, there are educators who share the same vision for equity that these practices work to advance, um, but they might not yet be aware of these specific pedagogies or instructional approaches. And of course, there are also many places where these practices aren't so common. And so one of the questions that I thought about um, in addition to what these practices are, was how can we spread and scale these practices so that they're happening in more classrooms um, across the country? So one thing is that these practices need to be concrete so that teachers can readily adopt and implement them. To that end, it would be helpful to operationalize these practices in ways that are accessible for teachers and importantly in ways that fit with their existing practice um, and within the infrastructures in which they are required to operate. 
Um, and so high leverage practices do just that. They provide teachers with concrete actions and routines that they can use to support learning. Another possibility is that curricula could incorporate these high leverage practices directly within their materials. Things like teacher tips and discussion prompts can be written into curricula so that teachers have those, um, those guidelines and those ideas right there in the time and place that they're um, teaching their content. And finally, pre-service teacher education and in-service professional learning programs can also focus on equity and teach these practices specifically so that more teachers know about them and have opportunities to implement them. So more work remains certainly to investigate the large scale uptake of these practices and their influence on student experiences, uh, student identity and belonging in science, student learning, and ultimately student career trajectories as well. Uh, but for now, we have a strong set of evidence-based instructional practices and some ideas and strategies for bringing them to scale. Thanks. And now I'm going to pass it back to Louise, actually, so she can get us started with the Jamboard. Louise, you're on mute. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes, we would like to involve all of you now. You've been listening to us for a little over half an hour, about half an hour. And um, we have a Jamboard that I have put in the chat that you could just click once on that link. It should bring you to our Jamboard. And um, where we're asking you to consider how intersect the intersecting pandemics we've talked about have highlighted or exacerbated inequities in your professional world. And you can just post your thoughts using the, um, the little sticky note feature on the Jamboard. And we'll take, we'll take a couple of minutes uh, for people to have some time to reflect on that and to write up a sticky note or, or post in any way that you want on the Jamboard. I'm getting a message that says there are too, currently too many people viewing this file, try again later. I don't know if others are getting that message. I hope folks are able to access the Jamboard. We've never done a Jamboard with more than 20 people at a time, so. It looks um, like there are about 65 of us on it. <laughs> okay. So once you type, if you could leave, then more can come in. So there is a limit. So once you have a chance, so maybe reflect before you get on the Jamboard. Once you know what you want to write, go ahead and write it and then get off the Jamboard so that somebody else can enter. Could I screen share the Jamboard? Let me, I, I couldn't get into it before. There we go. I will note there are various frames at the top in the center. So if you go up to the arrows and you click on next frame, the same question is posed, but there will be more space to post your stickies there. I'm already seeing some that we'll be talking about briefly. Uh, essential workers with young children at home, lack of access to health care. Yeah, I'm seeing a number on access to child care.
it's kind of academic gap as well. Due yeah. To COVID. I see here um, a lack of access to scientific knowledge, um, given that scientific articles are often hidden behind paywalls, relating to what you were discussing, Ross. That's one big thing as well. Um, you know, PK through 12 teachers don't have access to those journals oftentimes, the newest research, the newest things being talked about. Wonderful. Well, um, thank you for posting those. You can continue to post um, uh, as we move on. And we'll be coming back to this. So now that you've thought about the context that you're working with, as we continue to do our, our next three presentations, um, to think about what you can learn from these presentations, the ones we've already had, the ones we're moving on to, about what steps can be taken to transform um, these contexts so that, um, so that we can not go back to normal. Okay, so if we can come back to the slideshow, if we can go on to the next slide, um, I am going to turn it over to Alejandra. Thank you. Hi, I am Alejandra. I'm originally I'm from the Bahamas and moved to Colorado just in August. And today I am representing the voices for the international students. Um, According to the Department of Homeland Security, an international student is someone who does not have U.S. citizenship or permanent resident status in the U.S., but will only study in the U.S. under a temporary non-immigration status. There are various types of student visas. However, today we will discuss the most used student visa, which is the foreign exchange visa, also known as F1. The F1 student is for study at an accredited um, U.S. college or university um, within the U.S. As a college student, you have all faced the same reality. As a senior in high school, and that's the fate of making sure you had a good grades, great SAT scores, FAFSA completed, um, some form of scholarship, and that you can receive an acceptance letter for, from your first choice. However, for international students, the pressure of this process is much greater. To become an official international student, you have to go through a, a series of vetting process, which consists of immunization records, a bank letter, and statement that represents one year tuition and fees. For example, if the school fee for the year is $50,000, the parents must demonstrate that they have $50,000 US dollars sitting in their checking account awaiting to pay the school fee listed. Thirdly, the student is provided an I-20 with a tracking number with their personal information. Fourth, a student CVIS payment of $350, a student visa application of $160, and a minimum of two month, a two-month wait for an interview depending on your nationality and country of origin. During the interview, with a visa officer, international students are aware that this process can determine if their future of an education can all fall apart by one person. In my experience, I have seen students denied a visa because they did not know the name of their institution president. I've seen students denied because they could not provide the curriculum of their first year in college, although most schools do not provide that until arrival. I've seen students denied because their parents had a sibling in the US. Students have been denied because minor offense, nonviolent crimes that, could, that were committed by their parents way before they were even born. I've seen prospect students denied a student visa because they told the interviewer they like to assist the United States. And, and the CVS policy states that international students cannot have a dual intent to remain in the United States after graduation. And if that was not bad enough, students are constantly being interviewed um, or searched by a border patrol agent who can deny them at any port of entry and cancel their visa at any time. Students who make it past these rounds will feel that they have scored the ultimate victory. However, it is not until they matriculated in, in um, matriculated is when they realize that their journey of the American dream has just begun. Out of the entire list 
um, the CVIS is the most complex uh, set. The acronym uh, from, for CVIS is called the Student Exchange Visitor Information System. According to the National Association for International Education, which is we also known as the FAFSA, NASFA, sorry, international education became a great relevance to the United States when Mr. J. William Fulbright recognized how international culture exchange had a great influence and advancement in the U.S. classroom. Fulbright was so convinced that the international education would help advance America, he created a scholarship called the Fulbright Scholarship, where students from various countries can earn an education in the U.S. and return to their country with new knowledge, and the U.S. citizens can travel to other countries, learn their information, and use it in the U.S. However, international students that came to the U.S. would meet their faith with many disadvantage, disadvantages from the CVIS po policies. In 1993, during the World Trade Center bombing, one of the assailants that, attacked, that took a part of this tragedy was an international student on an expired visa. It was at this point the Department of F Foreign Affairs saw international students as a threat to the United States. The U.S. Patriarch was formed and international students suffered under the new act of the CVIS policies. The CVIS policies was used as a tracking device to prohibit international students from living their lives as a regular student. The prohibit, uh, the prohibit of working off campus, they were prohibited, sorry, of working off campus and only worked on campus for 20 hours per week unless you are a graduate and you are then able to work on a permit um, that pays that you have to pay $450 and wait a period of 90 days. Course load for undergraduate students cannot be less than 12 credits and graduate students must be full-time um, nine credit hours, which while domestic students can take a minimum of, of three credit course load at the graduate level and, and can sometimes take up to one class per semester as an undergraduate student. International students can only obtain one online course per term, and if they, they, if they are graduating within that same semester, sorry, with um, graduating um, in a, can graduate in that particular semester, they will have to take another unwanted semester just to complete. International students who may identify with LGBT pronouns other than male or female are not permitted to do so on any legal documentation. However, just yesterday alone, um, the first US passport was provided with gender X. This is just to name a few. However, international students pay three times as much in school fees. For many years, organizations argued that this is wrong. However, the impact was not felt and the awareness of discrimination was not seen until it was heightened during the COVID pandemic. Many institutions throughout the United States required their, facility, their faculty and students to transition to online courses by using Zoom, Google Classroom, and Canvas, just to name a few. According to research, many students dealt with depression, mental health issues, suicidal thoughts, and more because they felt isolated and perhaps could not understand how to navigate through online settings. Meanwhile, President Trump announced that international students needed to leave the country immediately because of the current CVIS policy that was still in effect. It was said that international students had one a week to leave the country, face termination of status or worse, deportation. If an international student stays one day over the period of the, um, of before departing, there will be a one year barred to this particular student before re-entering the um, before re-entering the United States. In addition to the, that, many countries required a negative COVID test to re-enter, which would mean if a student, if an international student is positive, they could not um, they could not travel and still face termination and deportation. Many international students were risking their lives, risk, risking their lives, health in order to save their future of everything that they had worked for. If the pandemic was not bad enough, when the vaccine were, was available, international students were initially denied by some institutions until all of their domestic students had access. At an institution in South Florida, 
If an international student tests positive, they were asked to leave campus and rent their own hotel rooms, although they were on campus students. The national organization stood up for the international students, but their voices were unheard until institutions such as Harvard, MIT, and other institutions, um, organizations such as Google, IBM, and 88 advocacy organizations fought for the rights and sued the Department of Homeland Security. July 18, 2020, the CVIS rules was rescinded and international students who were in the country can temporarily complete cl online classes. However, many international students who were set to enter could not do so unless they can prove that they were attending in-person classes. Therefore, many students had to forfeit their scholarships or delay their arrival or select another country as the destination of choice. The impact on international um, international contribution to the United States problem came, became greater than the international experience. Prior to the pandemic in 2018 to 2019, international students brought $54 billion to the US economy and created over 600,000 new jobs. They were responsible for 5.5% of students enrolled in higher education programs throughout the US. 80% enrolled into STEM programs, which is responsible for the, for the continued advancement in technology throughout the US. In 2019 to 2020, the, um, we recognized that there was a decline, mainly in the area after the pandemic, where um, the contribution went from $54 billion to $35 billion in revenue. 600,000 jobs went to a little over of 400,000 something jobs. The highest increase of student visa denials and only 8% work permits in the history of Department of Homeland Security. The US went from being number one as the international student of choice for education to falling behind countries such as China, Canada, Australia, and the United Kingdom, who have, never, who have seen their numbers increase due to their student visas friendly policies. Their policies allowed international students to work off and on campus work permits um, program much faster and a path to residency. And students also can study online. Oftentimes we hear the words diversity and inclusion. We think of training people how not to be offensive, use discriminatory words, how to include people of color in the classroom and workplace, how to respect people's religion and sexual orientation. But international student inclusion to be a, to be a regular college student does not apply in this category. President Biden administration have set forth the first proposal as a policy change is to found in the US Act of 2021, allowing PhD students that who graduate in STEM can automatically receive a green card, which, can, which will assist with the closing of the brain drain gap in the United States. Suggested ways for CVS policies to be more welcoming is to allow students to have dual intent, allow students to earn credit from the institution at their pace, provide more space for unseen medical reasons, allow students to work on and off campus during the first year of arrival, train academic advisors how to assist international students with course selection, allow students to apply with their choice of gender identification and provide more information to students on CBIS information. Thank you for allowing me to present at this time. We will hear from Lauren. Thank you. Actually, you get to hear from me first. <laughs> Thank you, Alejandro, for that very insightful presentation. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Nicole Lamb. And um, I'm going to be discussing today our child care crisis in Colorado. Now, this is the problem that started prior to the pandemic. Um, it has been exasperated due to COVID. And um, it's now highlighted as an essential area to address as part of our recovery effort. So I'm going to be focusing on the effects that COVID had on our child care systems, intersecting equity gaps, policy efforts to address the issue, and end with what we can all do to be a part of the solution in transforming our early childhood care and education system. Uh, just a couple of definitions to start off with. Child care can also be defined as early childhood care and education or ECCE. 
It spans from infancy all the way to school age, typically age five. And the childcare desert, according to the Center for American Progress, is defined as a census area with more than 50 children under the age of five containing no childcare providers, or there are three times the children per childcare slot. These childcare slots, each of them could be a half day or full day care slot. Now looking at the slide, 51% of our population here in Colorado live in what's qualified as a child care desert. So if you see in that image, everything in orange is what's qualified as a child care desert. Everything in gray is what's not qualified. And those dots, either dark blue or light blue, are showcasing some of the, the uh, providers we have across the state. You can see that the majority of our providers are along the front range and heavily uh, densely populated in the Denver metro area. Um, I'm gonna try to show you this link really quick. Hopefully everybody can see this. And hopefully it comes up. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so this is actually a geocoded map that was created by a team of researchers from the University of Minnesota. And it was to measure childcare access using census information of families within a 20 mile radius of providers. So on the left-hand side, everything in orange is going to be where there is um, either no childcare or limited childcare available. Everything in blue is where there's adequate childcare. And I can actually scroll across and you can actually see as I'm going, um, the different areas of, of where there's adequate or scarce um, child care providers. Now over on the right hand side, this is actually where we can look at economic and racial correlational data collected from the census as well. Um, we can look at these markers and I'm going to actually start with the poverty marker. Now it's going to change the color here and I'm going to zoom in on Fort Collins. This is where we are. Okay, so everywhere that's in dark red are higher populations of people living in poverty in the Fort Collins area. Now, if I go back to my arrows and I look at those dots, that's gonna show me where there are providers within a 20 mile radius of families that have children under the age of five, again, according to the census data. So it just gives you a sense of looking at, you know, central Fort Collins, there is adequate supply. Now the surrounding areas north and west and even on the Eastern side, do not have adequate supplies. I can also look at this data according to our Hispanic and Latinx populations in Fort Collins. So the darker greener where we have more densely um, communities of Hispanic and Latinx populations, the lighter colors are where there are less. Now again, if I go across, you can see how the dots represent where there's more scarcity or adequate supply of childcare hop back over to my presentation. Okay. So these three charts break down the geocode and, and census correlational data by race, urbanicity, and income. Note that people of color have the highest populations living in childcare deserts. Black and Latinx communities often have fewer resources to pay for childcare during economic recovery, while some families need childcare to perform essential jobs. Black and Latinx childcare providers may also be less able to access small, small business loans, such as those available through the PPP, due to discrimination in banking practices, the wealth gap, and higher debt ratios. In the center, you're going to see that suburban and urban areas have higher populations living in childcare deserts, and this is often due to numbers of providers compared to the demand of families in need. So, waiting lists for access are not uncommon in these areas. And lastly, on the right-hand side, we're going to note that lower income populations are more likely to live in childcare deserts. Often families in lower income areas work in essential sectors of our economy and require childcare to work and are not afforded paid sick leave or family leave. Providers in these communities with high numbers of families living paycheck by paycheck, they face greater demand for childcare as many parents are essential workers. These providers also see deep decreases in their revenue as the families suffer income or job losses and are unable to afford childcare. Now, according to the CDC, an essential worker is defined as 
those who conduct a range of operations and services in industries that are essential to ensure the continuity of critical functions in the United States. Childcare is one of these essential sectors. So COVID's impact on our childcare industry here in Colorado, here are some of the things that, it, that were impacted. Nearly 50% of our Colorado families reported lost income. One in 10 centers closed either temporarily or permanently. The enrollment for childcare decreased by 50% and 23% for public preschool. Now 23% of our childcare workforce were either furloughed or laid off and 42,000 women in the state of Colorado left the workforce between February, 2020 and October, 2020, many of them not to return to full-time work. There's also been increased costs for childcare providers because of supplies such as PPE, cleaning supplies. They've also had less revenue to meet the demands um, of spacing children. Now our BIPOC communities have been affected at higher rates and are more likely to be in occupations that offer no to few benefits such as that paid sick leave or family leave. So what efforts have been made during the pandemic to combat the childcare crisis? It's been highlighted so much so that even at the federal level, we've had millions of dollars come in thanks to the American Rescue Plan Act, the CARES Act and the HEROES Act. We've also had state legislative bills to bring in extra funding and direct those funds to help childcare centers stay open, keep their workforce paid and to try to help families. It simply isn't enough and we can all do our part. And here's what we can do. Number one, vote. It is voting season right now. Local elections are happening. So go ahead and get your vote in. You can also write an opt-ed to the local paper. You can connect with your local legislators and share your own story and your connection to childcare. You can contact them via phone, email, or set up a meeting with them. You can also attend one of their town halls, which is often posted on their Facebook page. And you can join local advocacy groups, such as the Colorado Association for the Education of Young Children, the Women's Foundation of Colorado, Save the Children Action Network, and Colorado Children's Campaign. Several of these actually offer free advocacy 101 trainings. And if you don't know how to contact your local legislator, it's actually quite easy. Start by going to leg.colorado.gov. Once on the General Assembly site, go up to the Find button on the right corner. Once you get to Find My Legislator, scroll down to the map, and in the search box, just put in your zip code. So when I put in my 80525 zip code, my two legislators pop up. It provides their phone number, email address, access to their website, and on their website is where you can access their Facebook page, or you can search through your own Facebook um, using their title and their name. Most importantly, remember our legislators work for us. So thank you so much for your time today and please do all that you can to combat our child care crisis. I'm gonna pass it on to Lauren. Thank you, Nicole. So welcome everyone, thank you for being here. I'm Lauren Valine, and this afternoon I'll be talking about the climate crisis and how we as educators, organizational members, and lifelong learners can help foster engagement with the climate solution system. So on the right, you'll see where we're headed in the next 10 minutes. So let's dive in. Next slide. Uh, so we're gonna kick off with these five key facts about climate change, which come from the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. And they're really just designed to quickly summarize the situation. So climate change is real, it's bad, Scientists agree, it's us, but most importantly, there is hope. We know a lot about what needs to happen to limit greenhouse gas emissions, and we have the technologies and practices to do that. But it's important to understand that there is no one magic bullet, and solving the climate crisis will depend on implementing all our available solutions, which includes both individual changes to behaviors and lifestyles, as well as systemic changes in areas like energy production and agriculture. So to help wrap our heads around what some of those climate solutions are, this chart that's put together by Project Drawdown, I think is a helpful figure. So here we're looking at the top 20 solutions that based on current data are projected to reduce emissions by the amount needed to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So on the right, you can see how they've categorized the emission sources 
And really what they've done is ranked each solution by its potential impacts. So in other words, where can we get the most bang for our efforts in the next 30 to 35 years? And some of these we can certainly contribute to by changing our individual behaviors. So like eating less meat and reducing our food waste in the home. But many of the most impactful solutions for reducing emissions will come from changing larger systems like transitioning our electricity production off of fossil fuels and protecting and restoring natural carbon sinks. And changing these systems really will require altering policies. So things like regulations, subsidies, and incentives. So the key point I wanna make here is that there are many ways to reduce emissions, but that the most impactful ones will require changing systems through collective actions and policies. And that has some important implications for how we're teaching and learning about climate solutions, which we'll circle back to in a few minutes. Next slide. So the climate crisis really intersects with other pandemics in almost every way, because successfully responding to climate change relies on all the social and political systems we already have in place. So here are just a few examples, but there are so many others. Um, so starting in the top left-hand corner, um, because of envi environmental racism in this country, BIPOC are more likely to live near coal plants and toxic waste sites and be exposed to environmental pollution pollutants. Um, so because of poor air qualities in these communities, Black children have suffered from higher rates of asthma, which as we know is a risk factor for severe, more severe cases of COVID-19. And as we continue to see more health issues related to climate change, from heat illnesses to allergies, inequities in the healthcare system will continue to be an issue. Um, and so in the right-hand corner, you know, Corinne did a really great job earlier of touching on the inequities in STEM education. And that really has a direct connection to diversity in environmental organizations because they do primarily hire staff from the STEM fields. And a 2018 study looking at diversity in environmental nonprofits found that only a small fraction of organizations were willing to report on their racial and gender diversity. So not only is there a real lack of transparency there, but of those that did report, it was found that the majority of board members and staff identified as white, and the majority of board members also identified as men. So currently many identities are not well represented here, and this has important implications for who's making decisions in these organizations and what types of initiatives and policies they will pursue and support. So I think the key takeaway here is really that all these systems are connected and we cannot successfully solve the climate crisis without also addressing racial and gender inequities. Next slide. So what does this all mean for teaching and learning? Um, to get a snapshot of current efforts, I looked at three systematic literature reviews on climate change education, and they all revealed similar trends. There's really been a focus on the climate science, so what are greenhouse gases, how do they work, where do they come from, and really trying to bring the topic of climate change down to a personal and tangible level. Um, and then another trend has to do with the chart at the bottom of the slide here. Um, and what this outlines are different types of actors and sectors for climate action. And what the reviews found was that most of the programs are really focusing on the individual actors in the private sphere. So encouraging things like reducing personal energy consumption by switching to LED light bulbs. And when you look at these trends, you might be asking, is there really anything wrong with this? And the short answer is no. In fact, strategies like making climate change personally relevant and encouraging individual behavior change has been put forth as best practices in both climate change education and environmental education. But if you think back to the earlier chart I showed that ranked the most impactful climate solutions and how many of those solutions rely on changing systems through collective action and policy, I think what's potentially problematic here is that if education efforts continue to primarily focus on changing individual behaviors, such as reducing electricity consumption, those behaviors are not going to change the fact that the electricity is still generated by burning fossil fuels, which as we know, is one of the largest sources of emissions. So there's a bit of a disconnect here between educational efforts and the systems we need to change. Next slide. 
So my big idea here is that we as educators, organizational members, and lifelong learners need to reflect on the ways we're talking about and incorporating different types of actions for climate change in the work that we do. There are ways that both individual and collective actions matter, but there are also some differences. Individual actions express our values and identity. We can see and feel good about the result. And very importantly, they're a form of social communication that can help shift social norms. Collective actions matter in many of the same ways, but beyond that, when people come together and act from a collective decision-making process, the outcome really is greater than the sum of what each person can accomplish on their own. And by working with people who have different perspectives and priorities, we really start to see how various systems are connected, we increase representation in the decision-making process, and we can really build power to change the systems that need changing. And so we need to think about ways to take the current emphasis on individual actions, expand that, and help learners move beyond themselves by creating bridges to collective actions and foster engagement in climate solutions at the systems level. Next slide. And so fortunately, there are some strategies that have been successful in fostering this type of bridge such as transdisciplinary, experiential, place-based, and participatory approaches, or the critical youth empowerment that Ross talked about earlier. And of course, these will look different depending on your context and your learners. Partnerships with other organizations are another great way to provide skills, learn with others, and really get inspired by the creativity that comes from collaboration. So to get us thinking about how each of us can be involved in climate solutions, I do have one tool to offer today. Next slide. So this is a climate action Venn diagram and the circle at the top is asking, what are you good at? What skills, resources, networks, reach or influence can you bring to the table? The second circle is what needs doing? So what climate solutions do you wanna focus on? And the third circle is what brings you joy? So what gets you out of the bed in the morning and what's the passion that will sustain you through this work? Because this really is the work of a lifetime. And if what you're doing makes you angry and crabby all the time, you're not gonna attract other people to your cause and you're probably gonna burn out. So this joy aspect is really important. And where these circles intersect is going to be different for everyone. And that's great because there are so many ways to be involved in climate solutions and everyone has special talents they can bring to this work. So whatever ends up being in the center of the diagram for you, imagine that as one ripple. And then think to yourself, what would it mean to go one ripple further? Because that my friends is how we begin to change systems. Next slide. So to wrap up, I'd like you to leave you with one final thought which could really be applied to any of the topics talked about today. It's a quote by Jane Goodall who said, you cannot get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. What you do makes a difference and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. Thank you. And now I'll turn it back over to Louise. Thank you. And now we want to turn it over to all of you. Um, we've just been over, you know, uh, five different presentations looking at efforts to address inequities, existing equities or inequities that were further exacerbated by intersecting pandemics through systemic practices, through systemic policy change, and, uh, and a number of different tools and resources were offered for thinking about um, how you can affect change in your own sphere of influence. So before we come back to talk as a whole, we wanted to give you a chance to think this through in some small group discussion. And I'm putting some questions in the chat um, to think about in addition to the questions that are here. So how does the information covered in this talk inform your own work? What inequities existed or have been exacerbated by the intersecting pandemics in this, in this context? What steps can be taken to create systemic change in this context of yours? And what tools, resources, or approaches were shared that can be useful in your context? 
So we're going to um, get you assembled into breakout rooms of about five people each. We do hope you take this time to briefly introduce yourselves to each other and, um, and share your thinking and your ideas and questions for each other. Um, we'll take about 10 minutes and then we'll come back to share out across the whole group. Okay, and we've got um, our moderators are working on setting up the breakout room. So whenever you're ready, we're ready. I ended up in a breakout room. But I and I kind of feel lucky that I did because there was a really interesting conversation that happened there. So I'd be happy to kind of get things going. Um, so the thing that struck me from our conversation was how interconnected all of this is. I mean, in a way, it seems like we had five different converse, different presentations. Yes, all related to these intersecting pandemics, but the intersections between them are so um, numerous and strong. And so we were talking about um, math education and science education and social work education and the um, the fact that apparently environmental criteria are now also included um, as a requirement in the new social work curriculum. If I said that wrong, please please correct me. But um, and so also just talking about building students' identities as scientists, as mathematicians, as citizens, as um, environmentalists, environmentalists from a, a young age so that they can have that foundation throughout their education um, all the way from early childhood through you know, secondary education and post-secondary education and beyond. Um, and also using um, the climate crisis as a way to introduce ideas about um, science literacy and um, critical literacy in terms of uh, understanding and analyzing media, um, and also bringing stronger relationships between students' lives and their science and mathematics curriculum too. So just kind of really brought everything together, which is what I loved about that discussion. That's great. Thanks for sharing that, Corinne. Anybody else from Corinne's group want to share anything in addition? How about from other groups? You can write in the chat or you can just unmute your mic. Yes. We'd really love to hear your ideas or your questions. So I had a, a question. I was in Curran's group that uh, with that discussion, but I think um, I guess the question is what would be a good kind of like pro my the school I'm student teaching at they have like an ELO period kind of it's not always a study hall, but like the teacher can kind of almost make it whatever they want. Um, and just wonder if there's any kind of like programs or, or templates out there for like those kind of like short, shorter, you know, 50 minute to hour things that you can kind of start up at a school or something like that. Yes, for sure there are. Um, I, I actually once worked with somebody in their ELO period doing a program that actually Ross and I are going to be talking about in the next session of the diversity symposium um, called the uh, public achievement program and it it's designed specifically for uh, use in schools as well as after school programs to support students in becoming engaged citizens who make a difference in their community based on their own uh, you know the, the, the needs they identify in their communities. And there is a, it's called the Public Achievement Program. There is a resource for that out of the University of Minnesota. And uh, feel free to email me and uh, Tony and, and I can send you that information. I'm gonna put my email here in the chat. 
to that, you are welcome to write for more information. How about the others of you, whether you're audience members or presenters, do you have other ideas for what can be done in, in an enrichment period in a classroom? Lauren, is there anything in particular around um, citizen science? Wow, there are a lot of, of citizen science type things out there. Um, I would recommend if you're looking for something like in the environmental realm, checking out um, sitsci.org or the National North American Association for Environmental Education, otherwise known as NAAEE. And I can put that in the chat because it's quite wordy. Um, but they have a lot of great resources, curriculum guides for all sorts of different environmental issues from climate change to water um, to more conservation-based type stuff. And, and they do a really good job with, job with practitioner guides. Um, so those are definitely some resources that I would recommend checking out if you're looking for some enrichment period stuff. Another uh, idea might be, um which kind of ties into public achievement might be some photo voice projects or something like that, where you have youth take pictures of things they would like to see changed in their community or environment, um, bring them to class and, and kind of uh, uh, create captions for, you know, what's going on in the photo, what they would like to change, and then trying to facilitate some kind of mechanism for them to be able to go out and make that change, which is the hard part, you know, that uh, of that, but the photo voice is always a really great uh, way into um, kind of critical reflection on community. It might be a good idea for a 50 minute class. I see Kesha, is that how you pronounce your name? How's your it's, hand up? It's, Ke it's Keisha. Keisha. Um, and I just had a um, just a comment in, in regards to the presentation uh, in two areas. Um, uh, the one in terms of um, the in climate change and the environment and Colorado, especially certain places around Fort Collins or within Fort Collins are always listed on these lists of favorite place to be and live and things like that. And it always bothers me when I see these trucks driving down the street that do those with those things that just push the black smoke out of the tailpipe or up in the air. And I just think, I look at that and I think that has to be a complete contradiction and, and uh, 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 com in conflict with people who hike, I mean, that's just going up into the air. So that's just a comment in terms of that. It's just always surprising when I see that. And uh, my other comment was just on um, Aleandra's uh, um, presentation where, and I don't remember where I saw that before about the international students needing to have um, so much money in the bank before they can register and, you know, do the, go through the process. And it's just, um, it's just, it's, it's just to hear it again, it's just really just like surprising. And it's, it's just um, very, very, I mean, obviously it's discriminatory. I just can't even find the words right now because I think about that. You have so many different people who take advantage of different programs that are um, um, designed to give them an upper hand. And there's no, you don't have to prove that you have this in the bank so that you can take advantage of this program or so that we can give you X, Y, Z. And so it just floors me that an international student that's interested in actually um, attending school and, 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 you know, trying to broaden their horizons has to prove this in order to justify the other when these two don't even go, you know, they're not they don't go together. They're not, you know, it's not something you don't need this in order to learn. Learning happens because you have a desire and an interest in something. And it doesn't matter how much money you have in the bank, it's your effort and your energy and your desire to, you know, your, and your interests. And so just hearing that again about the money that's needed for international students is just, you know, um, upsetting. Aleander, did you want to follow up on that? And I know we only have a minute left, so this will be a final yes, comment. I, I wanted to um, thank Keisha for um, reiterating and bringing that to the forefront um, because e um, even when you think that there's an alteration, for instance, if a student was to receive a full scholarship, 
um, the rule is you just need to show that you have some type of sponsor. However, when you get to the embassy, they will still ask, well, can you still provide a bank letter or something from you, from the parents or proving that you will return back to this country? Like if you don't, if you rent, you will be denied because you don't own a, your parents don't own a house or you can't, if you make a certain amount of money um, receiving it every week, you still can't afford to be here. So it's just these different rules that constantly um, comes up by a visa officer that has probably no clue of why you're even studying or how much this means to you and some most of the time they're coming because this career path is not in their country my own is an example we don't have a phd program there we barely have a stem program there so you know us would be my choice um not you know trying to obtain this knowledge and to be prohibited and most students who are prohibited just because they want to learn and help advance whether it's the us or their country having to be denied that opportunity is just not right. So could I, could I say yeah, something to you? We do, and we do, I was reminded we do have to end on time. So if, if this is just like a 10 second comment. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I work with international students and I know Alejandra. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't get to hear every all of your presentation because I had to meet with another international student. But I just want to say, that perspective is assuming that international students are only taking from the US and it's not taking into account that they bring so much to our students on campus and our universities um, here. So it's really a benefit to our country to bring these folks here because we benefit from them as well. So the barriers should not be there the way that they are. Absolutely. I'm glad you got to say that because that's really the point of, of all of this is, you know, we're, we're made richer by our diversity. Um, and, and what's really important is that we don't go back to normal. We don't go back to a world um, full of these inequities that uh, close off opportunities for just way too many. And, uh, and particularly those have already been historically marginalized. So we've really appreciated this opportunity to share with you and to, to interact with you to some extent. Um, do feel free to email any one of us afterward. And there is an evaluation form. Uh, Nicole, I don't know if you need to share the screen again to show that, but I think, I think everybody was given access to it. I don't remember. Um, uh, so Nicole will share that screen. There is an evaluation form that we would really appreciate your taking a couple of minutes to fill that out. So um, we'll be sending the, I think you're going to be able to get access to the, um, to the PowerPoint um, at some point, as well as the recording and um, I don't think I'm able to put this in the in the chat. I'm not able to copy and put it in the chat, but we, we do hope you have access to the evaluation form and can fill it out. So thank you everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon and a wonderful weekend. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you, great presentations. Thank you.